uh, have a collaboration with several department uh, in um, Faculty of Engineering. Then we spread our collaboration to medical doctors. And in 2018, uh, we start our spin-off company uh, that uh, um, produce our uh, first uh, bionic hand at that time. And we are promoted to be one of a center of excellence in 2019. Uh, in Indonesia. So right now, CPOMS is one of center of excellence uh, in Indonesia, uh, which have a collaboration with several university, several boards, several hospitals in Indonesia. And uh, in this forum, we hope that we able to strengthen in our uh, collaboration with uh, several university. And uh, we hope that we able to uh, develop new products, um, share our publication and doing uh, research together with all of you. And uh, in 2020, we have a good achievement in Anugrah Inovasi Indonesia at that time. Uh, this uh, event, uh, we get uh, the second winner for Anugrah Lembaga Litbang Jirap. Litbang Jirap means penelitian, pengembangan, pengkajian, dan penerapan uh, innovation in uh, higher education. And at that time, uh, we got second rank. Uh, so uh, our reputation in uh, Indonesia has been uh, well known in uh, several university right now and several hospitals. Uh, then I hope that you can visit our website in www.sepium3s.undip.ac.id and also our YouTube, uh, Sepiomes Undip. And uh, we uh, have um, journals. Uh, some of you, uh, I hope that I can invite uh, undergraduate, uh, master students or doctoral students to submit uh, your research, your review in our uh, journals. This is uh, JPOMS, Journal for uh, Biomedical Science and Bioengineering. You may visit in uh, ejournal.undip ac.it uh, and we are welcoming you for the second edition in October 2021. Uh, please visit and submit your paper. And I also would like to uh, share you our uh, researchers. Uh, this is researchers coming from uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, industrial engineering, and faculty of science and mathematics and maybe uh, some of the researchers, I cannot display uh, the picture of her here. Uh, and we have a collaboration with uh, medical doctors from uh, Rumah Sakit, uh, TNI Surabaya, Nevi Hospital, Dr. Amelan in Surabaya, uh, Karyadi Hospital, National Diponegoro Hospital, Orthopedic Soharso Hospital. And it is an honor for us to have a collaboration with uh, some of these medical doctors publish the journal and develop some products. And we also have a collaboration with a lecture in nurse, uh, orthotic, prosthetic, uh, in uh, several polytechnics in Indonesia. So we have a, a wide collaboration and uh, we also have a startup right now, which uh, we are able to uh, do some design, uh, manufacturing, and prototyping product. Uh, so you may visit our website, Kama Techno. Uh, we uh, already developed some of product with uh, introduced to the market. And this is some of uh, update in CP C Biomass Research in biomechanics, biomaterials, biomechatronics, and bio signal processing. Uh, this is uh, Nibris. Uh, we already uh, distribute 
to some of medical doctors with uh, the orthopedic specialist supervision. Uh, we try to develop the national products compared to some of imported product in Indonesia. And in biomaterials, we develop uh, biodegradable screw. We have a collaboration with uh, some researcher from UNES and also the medical doctor from Karyadi Hospital. Uh, we create hydroxyapatite from green muscle, uh, the organic living, uh, living organism. Um, and then we create the filaments. After that, we are trying to uh, uh, develop the biodegradable screw and uh, scaffold, biodegradable scaffold uh, for some of the medical doctors. So this is our research in biomaterials. Uh, maybe I will not share uh, all of our research, but this is only part of the research that we conduct in CBiomes. And this is uh, the uh, robotic research. Uh, we uh, introduced uh, this uh, robot in 2020 on uh, June. And then uh, from this platform, we developed the humanoid robot in uh, 2021. Uh, we uh, step by step developing the uh, graduation robot that will be using this uh, robot in the first uh, graduation on July 2020. Uh, this uh, represent three best students from uh, faculty, every faculty. So uh, the best student from uh, each faculty uh, have an opportunity to meet uh, rectors, uh, get uh, the certificate of graduation from rectors and uh, doing the uh, digital or uh, online uh, shake hand with uh, the rectors. So this is our uh, first uh, graduation robot in Indonesia. And then uh, our uh, city major, Pak Hendi Hendar Prihadi, Wali Kota Semarang, uh, asked uh, CPOMES to develop uh, the robots. And uh, we uh, give the robots to the uh, Pemerintah Kota Semarang on uh, May. And uh, this is uh, the robots that uh, we have uh, two types, uh, the robot for uh, medical application and uh, the robot for uh, health, uh, for public services. Uh, we have a, a strong collaboration with uh, the alumni from uh, Diponegoro uh, students and also uh, several students that working for the last project, uh, the final project in uh, our faculty of engineering. And for signal processing, this is the one that we still uh, doing right now. We are observing how uh, the normal people walk and then we try to develop uh, the bionic foot right now. This is the concept and we already created the first prototype of the bionic foot right now. Uh, we have a collaboration with uh, Karyadi uh, Medical Hospital. Uh, one of uh, the orthopedic specialists is right now is the uh, doctoral student in CBiomes for developing uh, the Bionic food. And this is our flagship product, uh, the Bionic Hand. 
uh, that we developed in 2020-2021. Uh, this is uh, Indonesian worker in uh, South of Korea, uh, which coming back to Indonesia and then get the amputation, uh, recover with uh, the by our bionic hands, and then right now he uh, go to Korea again for uh, being a worker. So it is a good thing for us to uh, share uh, this bionic hand which already been tested with uh, the researcher from industrial engineering with this device, we call it as Pinteray. And this device is developed by our uh, researcher in CBiomes, uh, Bu Novi and uh, several students. So uh, we not only develop the product, but we also test the product. Uh, and um, I guess this is the first Indonesian bionic hand that introduced uh, to the society uh, and already been uh, daily use uh, for the person with dis disability. Okay, and uh, in this 2021, we also asked to uh, introduce this to uh, the Ministry of Defense, uh, Kementerian Pertahanan, uh, Rumah Sakit Dr. Suyoto, Jakarta Selatan. Uh, right now, this product is uh, already been used by one of uh, the TNI staff. And this is our newest product uh, related to uh, therapy, for hand therapy. So this also a collaboration between the medical doctor and a researcher from Faculty of Engineering. We develop a hand therapy, especially in elbow, that uh, can be operated using uh, a remote control. And this uh, already been uh, added by uh, Surface AMG. And this signal is transferred to the Internet of Things, to the cloud, and then uh, the user in using their Android able to uh, get the result how uh, the uh, therapy conducted for a patient. So the doctor, the family able to see the progress of uh, the patient during uh, the hand therapy. So this is our newest product for elbow uh, therapy, and this is for uh, the uh, finger uh, therapy. We also uh, using the remote controls for uh, controlling uh, the device. And in this uh, pandemic uh, session, in this uh, pan uh, pandemic situation, uh, this will have a benefit to reduce the contact between the physiotherapist to uh, the patient. Uh, the controls can be conducted uh, a, li a little bit far from the patient. So it is not the direct contact to uh, the patient and which be uh, more safe for uh, the physiotherapist. Uh, so uh, this is our introduction that CBOMS is a research center. We develop a product, we uh, publish some research and then in this first session of guest lecture, we invite our distinguished speaker to give uh, the uh, lecture about the soft robotic, the one that we still uh, not develop much in CPOMS that we hope that then we have a further uh, and future collaboration uh, among us. Um, then well, I hope that uh, after this session, uh, research collaboration or product development, or you also, uh, some of you who still in undergraduate can be, uh, you can uh, uh, choose Diponegoro University, especially Faculty of Engineering as the destination for master or uh, doctoral degree for uh, master program and doctoral program, uh, which uh, we have already collaboration with several hospitals, especially for the research in biomedical engineering. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. 
uh, and I hope that you able to enjoy this uh, case lecture uh, and uh, we give the time and the screen to uh, Bunovi. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ismail, for the presentation. And now we will uh, start for the first session of the guest lecture. The first uh, speaker is um, Mr. S. M. Hadisadati, Doctor of Philosophy, with the title Soft Robotics Development for Medical Application. And the moderator is uh, Bapak Munawar Agus Riyadi, Doctor of Philosophy. Bapak Munawar Agus Riyadi, Doctor of Philosophy, is a lecturer in Electrical Engineering in Ponegoro University. He got uh, the Bachelor and Master degree in Institute of Technology Bandung and uh, the doctoral degree from the UTM Malaysia. We would like to invite Bapak Munawar Agus Riyadi to start the first session. To Bapak Munawar Agus Riyadi, the time and media is yours. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Novi, for the introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you to all participants who have joined us today. We are now in the first session of CDMS guest lecture, and in this session, I will lead and the moderator for the talk, which will be delivered by our honorary guest lecturer, Dr. Syed Muhammad Hadi Karati. Before we start, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker. Uh, Dr. Sadati is uh, a CME Research Fellow at the School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences, King's College London, UK. He finished his PhD in Robotics from King's College London in 2018. He has been a postdoc in Robotics at King's College London from 2019 to 2021 and in morphological computation at the University of Bristol. He also a uh, visiting researcher at Ecole Polytechnique Federal de la Fong, uh, Switzerland, as well as the Prof. Ian Walker's lab at Clemson University, and also in Dyson School of Engineering Design at Imperial College London. He also served as review board in several prestigious journals, and his research interests are soft medical robotics, morphological contribution, and system dynamics. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Sadati to deliver his lecture with the title of Soft Robotics Development for a Medical Application. The talk will take about 40 minutes and then followed by QA. Dr. Sadati, uh, time is yours. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, clear. Yeah. yeah uh, hi, salam alaikum. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this interesting event. Um, I'm um, Hadi Sadati. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Monavar, for uh, introducing me. Um, so I can uh, jump in, jump start my presentation then. Um, okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, it's already seen. Okay, it's, it's already there. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Hadi Sadati. I'm uh, at the moment a, a CME Research Fellow at um, Arvim Lab, King's College London. Um, here we are working on uh, the development of uh, robotic instrumentation that delivers stem cell to disable retinal layers. Um, a bit about myself, I'm a family man who loves uh, traveling a lot uh, and also doing good science. Um, you can have a look at my website to, to know more about me, but uh, in short, um, 
I've done my uh, bachelor's and master's in good uh, in uh, two of the best universities in Iran. Uh, then did a PhD at King's College London while visiting uh, visiting uh, Imperial on Clemson University. Um, have been a postdoc at uh, Bristol University and King's College London uh, while I was a visitor at EPFL as well, and recently appointed a uh, two-year CME uh, research fellowship at King's College um, London. At Arvin Lab, we're focusing on this. At Arvin Lab, we're focusing on um, uh, preocularly navigated extraceptive snake robots for novel retinal interventions. Let me think. Uh, let me talk a bit about that. So. Um, um, uh, Age-related macular degeneration is a disease which deteriorates uh, the, um, um, the retinal layer uh, in, uh, in elderly people. And it is actually uh, the uh, leading main, um, reason for blindness at the moment in the UK. Um, so the disease is like this. Uh, the center of the retinal layer, which is the help you see a healthy one here, uh, uh, slowly uh, dries out and generates uh, some um, um, uh, generates some uh, scar-like um, um, tissue at the center. The result is uh, losing eyesight, the central eyesight. And you've probably um, have heard from um, elderly uh, people in your family that they cannot see uh, properly. Uh, when they're looking straight and they have to read text, et cetera, um, um, via the sides of their eyes. So recently there has been shown that we can uh, use stem cells to, uh, to uh, regenerate the, uh, the scarred uh, tissue in the uh, retinal layer. Uh, in our lab, we're focusing on the development of a flexible robot to deliver that uh, um, a stem cell trophy. The robot is uh, a multi-tube um, continuum manipulator you see in action here, which we call concentric tube robots. The robot is made of two uh, nitinal hyperelastic nitinal tubes that uh, can move um, with respect to each other. They basically can slide and rotate. And based on uh, the relative rotation and translation, you get a very flexible um, um, configuration from the robot. It is really good to, um, it, it gives you like a needle size controllable uh, configuration uh, continuum robot. Um, and as a result, um, you can have, uh, you can uh, pass narrow spaces um, in the body and also reach places that otherwise uh, it would be really invasive. In our case, reaching the retinal layer requires removing part of the um, part of the skull and also part of the tissue around the eye. But now with this technology, we can actually go around the eye orbit and reach the uh, the surgery site. Uh, in the design phase, we have simulations that helps us design the correct parameters for initial curvature and length and also stiffness of these tubes. In the modeling phase, we have uh, um, developed reduced border dynamic models to effectively capture uh, the behavior of these tubes. Um, and it's not actually an easy one to capture. You see that there are unstable configurations here that uh, basically the tubes suddenly change orientation as a result of the interaction of the um, bending and torsional uh, elasticity. So in the modeling uh, part, um, we try to capture the dynamics um, precisely. And then in the, in the safe control um, procedure, we have, um, we have developed a planning method based on pre-computation uh, of um, uh, a table of configura possible configurations for the robot. And based on the geometry that we want to 
navigate and also the desired path, uh, we develop a very fast search algorithm in that table, in that lookup table that gives us the, uh, the um, required um, orientation and inputs for the row. And, and you see here, for example, based on uh, such a lookup table, we can generate the manipulability and dexterity map of the uh, environment. Uh, the um, green are um, the reachable space, while the other colors are the places that it's harder to, to reach. Also, you see uh, the, the point cloud around the, the robot tip that also shows how um, reachable and how um, dexterous the robot is at each uh, position and at each um, configuration. And finally, we, um, uh, we work on VR-assisted uh, robotic design. Uh, basically, the surgeon or uh, the um, medical students uh, or the engineers, they can uh, put a VR headset on and try playing with the robot in a realistic environment um, similar to uh, the surgery. This is an overview of the project that I was uh, involved with, the Pioneer project at Arvim Lab. If you're interested, please have a look at uh, the Arvim uh, online website to know more. Um, let's, let's talk about the working principle and system design behind uh, these uh, type of robots that we call concentric tube robots. They're made of uh, multiple precurved tubes. The red uh, line is a tube one, blue is tube two. And you see they have a, uh, an almost a straight part here, and then an initially bent part here. When we push the um, smaller tube inside the larger tube, um, as a result of the different initial curvature of the tubes, the overall structure settles in a bending and intermediate state, which is not as uh, highly bent as um, the tube one initial shape or as um, um, the tube one initial uh, shape. It's actually settled somewhere in between. Now we can actually move uh, the tubes with respect to each other, move forward and backward, and also we can rotate them with respect to each other. As a result, we, get, we can get very complex shapes out of the interaction of these two tubes. Uh, this concept has been um, proposed in 2005 uh, and six uh, in um, Korea and later on at Vanderbilt and Harvard University. Since then, the last 15 years, there has been numerous publications and applications for concentric tube robots, also known as active cannulas. Uh, um, and the research on, on them is still ongoing, but you can see the possibilities in front of a needle-sized continuum robot in medical applications. And um, this is kind of the um, working setup that, uh, we have at the moment, um, we have a compact actuation unit that, uh, at, uh, that is attached at the end of a medically grade uh, cuckoo arm for the concentric U robot. Uh, we benefit from um, autonomous homing of the robot with respect to uh, the patient's eye. And also we benefit from uh, fast uh, attachment and detachment mechanism for connecting the tubes, the, uh, the uh, nitinal tubes to the robot. We are trying to put a, uh, a, a robotic surgery mock, uh, a robotic mock operation um, room at King's College London. And uh, the things that you see is part of that. So, this is a phantom eye being used for training uh, um, eye surgeons. And here you see the two tubes that I talked about. It's now inside the, the, the eye. And here actually we have three tubes and uh, the surgeon can uh, basically 
uh, manipulate a camera and also manipulate the robot um, uh, while looking at the eye under a microscope. The goal here is to pierce uh, the blood vessels in the retina for drug del delivery. And you see that the tip of after positioning, tip the tip of the robot can uh, approach the, uh, the desired locations of retina and do a puncture or uh, pierce uh, uh, the blood vessel for delivering the intended uh, drug. Uh, we work on multi-arm uh, concentric tube robots as well. You see uh, here the actuation setup behind a multi-arm version of that robot. Uh, you see here one of the arms in action. But if you pay close attention, you see that we have a camera arm and also we have a gripper arm. It is actually this part of the robot. It's a bit small, but you can see that we have a, a needle arm, a camera arm, a bit retracted, and also a gripper arm. The idea is uh, for these three arms to navigate around uh, the eye orbit, reach the optic nerve, uh, and uh, grip it, and then uh, do a precise incision there. You see, um, um, after developing the, uh, the setup, we uh, basically uh, verified the workspace of the robot around the eye orbit to show that it can reach the desired position and orientation. And then we conducted some tests on peak eyes because they have uh, almost similar properties to human eye. This is the eye and this is the optic nerve. This is where uh, that uh, we want to, uh, to perform an incision and drug delivery. We did some experiments on the stiffness of the optic nerve we, uh, as uh, we get further away from uh, the stem where it is attached to the eye and compared it with uh, our um, phantom eyes made of silicon. Then uh, we did experiments on um, the uh, piercing force needed to penetrate uh, different sheets in the optic nerve. And uh, there are basically uh, a sheet and also the optic nerve it itself and identified the required force to be around one uh, around 0.1 Newton. Then we used our robot to uh, perform the same incision uh, while the whole setup is fixed on a force sensor and showed the achieved uh, lateral and uh, normal forces by the robot are actually uh, good enough uh, compared to our uh, measurements on the peak eye. Uh, so the green and blue are the achieved forces by the robot and the dashed line is the threshold needed to uh, penetrate the optic nerve. The tubes are hollow, so after penetration, we can uh, easily uh, provide the drug needed uh, at the site. And here is a mock operation. This is uh, the gripper arm. Uh, the uh, the white um, tube is the optic nerve. It grips the optic nerve. Then uh, the um, incision arm or needle arm approaches and does the penetration or the incision. And the whole thing is uh, captured via the third arm that holds the camera. This is actually a, a, a phantom made out of silicon uh, the, uh, the actual size of the eye inside uh, um, phantom skull, of course. On the modeling side, uh, we need to, now we have a good robot. It has a, an interesting concept and also it's capable to deliver the uh, drug delivery that we intend. Uh, but uh, we need to understand how it uh, performs, how it behaves. Uh, in the last 15 years, there has been a lot of uh, development around the modeling of uh, continuum robots. Uh, but um, 
and also concentric tube robots. But no one has approached um, dynamic modeling of concentric tube robots. Um, well, there is only one uh, publication out, but the time that we started dynamic modeling of concentric tube robots, no one has done it. Uh, well, one group published meanwhile. Um, to, to explain how this uh, uh, dynamic modeling can be done, I want to show you a brief explanation of uh, how continuum robot and soft robot modeling is being done in general. So when you model a soft robot, you have to um, consider uh, the modeling assumption and the solution strategy. The modeling assumptions are, um, are uh, the system kinematics, uh, the, basically the geometry in a space, the system mechanics for governing equation or conservation of law. So basically uh, what keeps the system together and then the material mechanics or constitutional law, how the material the underlying the material behaves. We have a brief paper on, uh, on that. And after you identify these assumptions, it's really easy to proceed with the modeling itself and then deciding what solution or strategy is the best for that. So speaking of that, with the, for the kinematics, you can do it in a continuous way or you can discretize the kinematics. For the system mechanics, you can use um, methods like beam theory, Kostrov's rod, principle of virtual work, or Lagrangian dynamics. And for material mechanics, you can assume it's a linear uh, uh, material and use Hooke's law, but you can uh, assume more complex methods like uh, new Hookean, linear lean, and Gantt assumptions. And also you can go for hyperelasticity, which is more similar to human. Beings. Later on, you can use the different ways of formulation, um, uh, either finite element formulation, um, using lump system approach, or uh, use a reduced Fourier approach, the method that I'm interested in. And the solution strategies um, uh, can be direct or indirect that I, I leave to you to have a look if you want. But speaking of the uh, kinematics, a soft robot or a continuum robot has a differential representation of orientation and configuration. So basically along a curve or along the backbone of a continuum robot, you should actually know the orientation and position uh, variation with respect to backbone curve length, which we show that by S. So we talk about some local frames attached to different positions along the backbone, and then measuring the strain, curvatures, and torsion in those frames as the backbone moves along the curve. Then we need to integrate that to get the uh, geometry of the world. But it's hard actually to implement that in a, a dynamic modeling and control framework. So a lot of uh, simplified methods are derived for that. One way is to discretize it. So assume that you have lumped masses and then you have just uh, rigid links, for example, in between or known transformations in between instead of having differential transformations. When you discretize, you either can use series rigid link uh, assumption. It's basically you assume the, the continuum robot is a hyper redundant rigid robot or highly articul articulated rigid robot. So basically you have rigid links, rigid rotations and transformations. The joints are rotation and transformations are the system strains, torsion and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and bending. Another way of discretization is, again, assuming lump masses, but in between uh, assuming an Euler Bernoulli beam. So the transformation comes from the uh, deformation of the Euler Bernoulli beam in between the lumped masses, not from the rigid transformation uh, of a rigid link robot. And finally, a method that is being used in finite element methods, you can again assume lumped masses, assume that this, the, uh, the position and orientation of the lumped masses are the system states, then, uh, find, then use an inverse map to find the 
uh, the formation of an Eulerian Bernoulli beam between the lumped masses. These are the three methods you can discretize a continuum robot kinematics. But what about continuous methods? In continuous, uh, uh, if you want to keep the, the uh, kinematics in a continuous manner, but uh, having a lower dimensional state space, you can use reduced order modeling approach. In those approaches, we assume that we define the backbone by a, um, a general curve like a polynomial, a spell line, um, or any other curve being used for uh, fitting um, in, in general, in a statistics, for example. Then after you fit that curve to the backbone geometry, the control points and the control um, parameters in that curve uh, become the state space in your system. So uh, one way is assuming a, a fitting the curve to a geometry and orientation, both. Another way is fitting the curve to the geometry and then uh, finding the tangent space to describe the orientation and then putting a, a correction twist on top. So this way is called the Bishop, the reduced order model, the Bishop frame representation of the orientation. Or finally, uh, another way is instead of fitting a curve to, a geomet to the geometry, you may fit a curve to the strain, curvatures, and torsion, and then um, um, calculate the geometry by integrating them, which is uh, named curvature parameterization, or basically curvature fitting. Um, if, if you use a uh, character parameterization, Euler Bernoulli with relative states or rigid series rigid bloom robots, you're working with relative states. But if you use the um, basically FEM uh, style for kinematics or uh, fits the backbone geometry and orientation, you're working with absolute states. So in a way, these three methods are similar and these three methods are similar with their advantages and shortcomings. I'm gonna cover some. But then we have to talk about the governing equation or system dynamics. We can use Lagrangian method. So we know that you have to calculate potential kinematic energies and then uh, form the Lagrangian and then um, uh, calculate the partial derivatives uh, um, with respect to states and then time and then collect the coefficients to form uh, a closed form um, a, a, in a vector formalism. So basically end up with a linear representation for uh, the acceleration. But there is an alternative method uh, called TMT method. It has been, uh, it's based on a Lagrange, um, um, uh, Lagrange publications before he basically pr presents the Lagrange and the well-known Lagrangian method. But uh, left aside, um, uh, because at the time there were no uh, computers to do um, uh, computations, uh, um, large number of co uh, computations. But recently people has uh, noted that TMT method is better than uh, using the log range itself because it lets you directly drive uh, the elements of this uh, closed uh, vector form. You see in the TMT method, you just uh, form the uh, kinematic relation and Jacobian transformations, and then you, you drive all of the elements di uh, directly in one step. But in Lagrangian method, there are multiple steps involved, forming the Lagrangian, calculating the uh, partial derivatives, and then uh, a very uh, resource intensive uh, uh, process uh, of collecting the coefficients for uh, the acceleration terms. So we use the TMT method, and actually we in implement that in a, a software package. The TMT method lets you drive the system dynamics like this. You have a mass matrix uh, in generalized coordinates on one side, and then you have the Coriolis and gravitational terms and also um, other conservation, conservative and non-conservative terms related to spring dampers in the system. And you can do a summation on uh, the elements or uh, the units in your system. So you don't need to drive the whole system at once. And also you can modify the system easily later. This is uh, the, um, the discretized representation. In a continuous representation, 
you basically substitute SIGMAS with integrals, and it works well. Let me show you some comparison about all of these methods that I uh, expressed. So if you use long system approach, uh, it's good for uh, dynamic modeling and nonlinear controller design, but uh, it's not very accurate. If you use constant curvature method, it's the least accurate one, but it is good for a structural um, uh, studies and a stru uh, incorporating a structural details into your uh, model. Uh, the modif the modif modified version of concept, uh, con constant curvature methods, uh, they improve the accuracy, but not that much. The best method, which is general, is Kosorot using differential kinematics. But then it's accurate and general, but it gives you uh, a, a, an infinite uh, number of state space, not suitable for dynamic modeling or controller design. And also it's hard to implement usually. And finally, there are shape function identification based methods that can give you the same uh, level of error as uh, the Kosorot rod model. Uh, so it's real time. But depending on how you learn that curve, uh, your model might be limited to the uh, learned data set. So it may not be general. And in general, if you assume, if you consider the change in the cross section as the robot moves, uh, you get 3% better accuracy in the model. So um, there are some comparisons based on different uh, models. You can have a look at uh, our RSS and IGR paper for more details, but in short, if you use a finite, a, 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 a finite element style kinematics, uh, the least complex and uh, dynamic model will be uh, the result. If you use series rigid link or, um, or model basically a robot like rigid robots, it gives you the worst um, derivation and equation optimization time. So it, it gives you the most complex uh, set of uh, equations. And if you use reduced order approach, the uh, fitting, the interpolation approach, um, it, it ends up in a, a small number of states for the model. And it's uh, uh, slightly better than um, this serious rigid link, serial rigid link assumption in terms of complexity of the derivations. But in terms of accuracy and sensitivity to numerical inaccuracy, uh, reduce or model is the most accurate and the least sensitive. So uh, there your simulation would remain robust, even in presence of um, uh, unstable modes and uh, a highly oscillatory modes in the system. Uh, it's a bit uh, computationally expensive for higher order of um, um, interpolation curves. The EBA or finite element uh, style is the most computationally efficient uh, and it provides good accuracy. Um, so it's good for larger systems. The um, serial rigid link method, basically modeling the robot like a rigid robot, it's the most sensitive to inaccuracies uh, and to numerical instabilities and doesn't uh, give the best sim uh, simulation results as well. So if you want reduced number of state space uh, and uh, a robust, sim robust simulations in presence of instability, uh, reduce or models are the best. But if you have a very large system uh, and you want uh, less complex derivations and computation uh, efficiency, the finite element styles are the best. Uh, we've developed a, T a MATLAB package, including everything that I described regarding the uh, TMT dynamics and kinematics representation. Um, we've tested that in, uh, in with a continuum manipulator named the stiff flop, uh, which is made of some uh, pneumatic uh, braided chambers. And we tested that in presence of external loads. Um, that was the first time that um, reduced order uh, dynamic based on shape interpolation introduced. And it could uh, provide the most accurate quasi-static model at the time of the publication of this uh, set of results. Later on, I used the same uh, modeling package for different problems for multi-section continuum robots, for uh, um, a continuum visker for palpating different uh, tissues, and also for modeling a spider web. Um, you see the simulation results uh, here, and also you see uh, snapshots of the 
um, the software implement um, user interface. But I'm going to show you a bit more. In, in short, uh, TMT Dyne package, uh, it's available online on GitHub. It can deliver equation of motion theoretical derivation for soft system suitable for control design. Uh, it includes different uh, soft robot kinematics, reduced order model, discretization, and series rigid link method. Uh, you can include geometric constraints, pendants, pneumatic, and hybrid actuation elements there. And it's a uh, it uses a MATLAB-based domain-specific language. We basically uh, used uh, TNT Dyne, and you see a glimpse of the, uh, uh, the interface to model our concentric tube robot. Uh, the, the, modeling way, the modeling analogy is having uh, fitting or interpolating the overall shape with uh, a spell line, overall shape of the concentric tube robot with a spell line, and then um, um, assuming the tubes behave on that spell line. Each tube has uh, its own um, twist angle. So basically, you can, we, we can implement both translation and rotation of the tubes with respect to each other. Again, the model is available um, online. We uh, verified a, a, our modeling approach experimentally. This is our experimental setup. Uh, we have two tubes. Uh, we have Aurora magnetic trackers to track them, and also the actuation unit you, you see here. Uh, with a set of uh, motors uh, for each tube and also encoders uh, and guard rails to, uh, to provide the translational motion support. Here are some of the results. You see the, uh, in, in this video, you see the tubes are, and in these two, you see the tubes are moving with respect to each other. Uh, Trans, uh, translate with respect to each other, but in these two, they rotate with respect to each other. And you see the unstable motion. You see the sudden release of energy uh, due to unstable configuration at some point. So of course, of course, it should be avoided in a medical setting, uh, but it, it would be good actually to, to use this high energy mode to uh, pierce a needle into tissue, for example. Uh, but the model, you see that the model can capture uh, the, the sudden release of energy, which we call SNAP. Uh, more results uh, showing, uh, ha having a look at these three plots uh, and comparing the solid line with the dashed line, you see how good uh, the model can capture the dynamics of the concentric tube robot uh, in simulations. We have, and uh, the last plots here are the error plots. Uh, we have some spikes around this unstable uh, region, but other than that, it's uh, the error is really small, around four percent, four to six percent, for uh, configurations away from uh, SNAP. Uh, we haven't done uh, um, only concentric tube robots. We extended the whole modeling framework and design framework to growing robots as well. Here we see a robot a soft robot for mammography. Uh, we have a very tiny robot here. Uh, it's a catheter, tendon-driven catheter, uh, with uh, a, a, an eversion growing soft sheath on it. The eversion growing soft sheath helps uh, moving the environment friction-free. So it basically um, wraps out uh, instead of uh, sliding against uh, the lumen. And the tendon derivation catheter is for moving that around. The, the goal is uh, navigating uh, the breast uh, tissue to find the locations of possible tumor. This is the robot that we uh, developed. Um, you see the growing part is, uh, is basically moving out first, then uh, the, the black, uh, a tendon driven catheter moves inside. Uh, so the growing part, uh, as I said, it basically rolls out. So it doesn't slide against anything. It, it basically rolls out. So you don't, the contact points don't feel any uh, iteration due to any, any irritation 
uh, due to a sliding of the continuum robot robots against it. And you see actually uh, the navigation of that continuum robot in this complex environment here. Uh, this is the working uh, principle. We have uh, a pressure uh, chamber. We have the groin side here, and we have uh, uh, two channels, uh, a bigger channel to move uh, the groin part uh, forward uh, with an inner channel to pass the tendon driven catheter. This is the fabrication setup that we had for precise um, fabrication of the groin um, plastic. Uh, and these are the actuation parts. So to move uh, forward the groin part and also uh, to, move, to move forward and bend um, sidewise the, the catheter part. And here is uh, the dynamic simulations again in the uh, in TNT Dyn uh, software package. Uh, the robot is moving forward, interacting with this object uh, while trying to move around. Um, and on the right, you see uh, the DSL implementation in the TMC Dyn uh, package. Uh, some results. Uh, on, uh, here you see the uh, actuation pressure cycle for different stages of uh, moving the robot in, uh, inside and retracting it. Here you see uh, the comparison of uh, the simulation and experimental results, the dash and solid lines, they're following pretty much uh, pretty good each other and also here. And here you see different snapshots of the simulation and experimental side uh, overlap to see the accuracy of the modeling framework. Some more soft robots. Uh, so basically with this, I'm, I'm uh, mostly finished with my presentation, but let me just show you some other soft robots that we're working on and soft robot application in medical scenarios. Uh, we use uh, continuum robots for palpating soft tissue to identify hard regions uh, in medical uh, settings. Uh, that's the way uh, that it's soft tissue like the breast tissue or abdomen tissue is being palpated uh, to, to investigate if there are abnormalities and possible locations of nodules and um, cancer uh, sites in place. Uh, and uh, we basically use a continuum robot to do that palpation and try to uh, measure uh, the stiffness and uh, the profile uh, based on uh, the force sensor reading at the base, not at the tip of the robot. Uh, and we compared it with the rigid probe. Uh, this is the structure of the robot that we use, uh, braided pneumatic chambers inside a silicon tube. And this is the phantom tissue with the hard nodule in it that we built. And this is uh, the uh, palpation scenario that we proposed. And we could actually um, generate the profile. You see, this is the profile of the soft tissue uh, with uh, uh, millimeter accuracy and also identifying the harder locations. So this is the normal stiffness and this is the uh, lateral stiffness. Uh, the color ball is basically the stiffness of the tissue and the geometry is the geometry of the tissue itself. You can have a look, look at our paper to, uh, for more results. Another design that we worked on is uh, an active tendril backbone robot. It is basically a, a, a shape memory tendril uh, that we actuate, we, uh, that we, when we heat it up, it basically shrinks. But if we heat up only part of the tendril, instead of shrinking, it bends sidewise. And we exploit that to have a highly articulated continuum robot. We basically, these are the uh, configurations you can get. These are, uh, this is the um, initial setup that we built. And this is kind of the uh, motion of the robot as you see. So red uh, parts are the parts that we connect wires directly to the tendril and passing uh, electricity through the wire selectively, it hits a part of the tendril and as a result, it, it bends uh, 
toward the direction that we intend to. And here are different uh, configurations. Also, we present a modeling framework there. Um, so you see the comparison of the model presented there with the actual experiments, which could provide good accuracy in uh, the planar cases. In basic, uh, sorry, the 2D projections. Okay, that was my uh, presentation. And these are uh, the people that uh, I've been working with. Um, to on different aspects of this presentation. Uh, mostly this is our uh, current team at King's College London, uh, the postdocs and PhDs. And also here you see uh, the supervisors um, yeah. at King's College London. Thank you so much for your, um, uh, for your attention. I would be happy to um, answer questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sadati, for the very interesting presentation. We have uh, seen many development of the soft robotics uh, as well as the modeling. Now we are in the Q&A session. Uh, due to the time limit, uh, we invite two or three questions for the audience. Please uh, raise your hand first, or you can type your question into the chat column. Share any? Okay. Uh, we have one uh, question. Dr. Yukas Kewan, uh, please, uh, you can ask directly. Thank you, Dr. Munawar. It is very interesting presentation, Dr. Hadi. Uh, I'm very interested with the continuum and soft robotics. We have tried to develop soft robotics uh, at our research center here at Sebiums. And then we found it is very difficult to uh, fabricate a well consistent um, component or materials for soft robotics. And you mentioned about the errors for different methods you have tried. You compare to the experimental uh, work, right? Uh, how do you make sure the, I would like to know how you make sure the error is not was not coming from the fabrication defect uh, because uh, I found it's very difficult to make well consistent, well mass property at all points along the continuum robots. That's one question. <laughs> May I have <laughs> two more questions? <laughs> it easy okay. for you to answer. The second one yeah. is um, okay. it's very interesting. Uh, uh, this presentation. So I have actually many questions. Three questions are enough this time. Uh, for your experiments, you uh, measure the tip position. What kind of sensors are you using? Are you using vision or camera for uh, position of the tip? And then right now, what is the settling time or the speed of response of this uh, continuum or soft robot uh, in terms of probably settling time or time constant? And then what are your targets for this kind of robot in terms of accuracy and speed of response to be uh, for these robots to be good for medical applications? Thank you. Thank you, okay. moderator. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, yeah. uh, just uh, answer directly. You can answer directly. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the interesting questions. Uh, so, um, you're right, the fabrication process of soft robots is uh, not flawless. Most of the, actually, uh, and we have uh, big issues uh, with that, especially if you're doing um, uh, a theoretical, you're taking a theoretical approach to model them. You, you usually rely on uh, precise fabrication and also uh, precise uh, understanding of the uh, material behavior, which is not possible. Um, so yeah, of course, the. Uh, the flaws in the fabrication causes errors. Uh, that's why we couldn't achieve better than uh, four to six percent error in our mm -hmm. simulations based on the theoretical frameworks. And the, the residual error it should be handled by learning methods. There is a large of uh, risk. There is a large uh, community around learning approach for, for soft and continuum robots that uh, they can achieve a very good accuracy. But you know, learning methods, uh, the accuracy of the method is limited to the richness of uh, the learned data set. 
So for cases like medical applications that you cannot uh, assume that you know all the possible interactions of a continuum robot with uh, soft tissue, learning methods might give you a, a still uh, large errors in, real, in reality. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, it causes errors. That's why we couldn't get better 6%, uh, better than 6% and to handle that learning methods are the best. Uh, we, achieve, we measure the tick error uh, via uh, magnetic trackers, NDI Aurora magnetic trackers. Uh, so they give you orientation and position uh, with, uh, I think, 10 micrometer accuracy. They're, they're really easy to, to use as well. But they did, doesn't give you um, the overall shape of the robot and the number of uh, sensors you can use is limited and also it should be away from magnetic fields. Uh, so we're using uh, vision-based uh, tracking as well in our team. Uh, the response time of the robots, it's actually um, uh, the response time of the robots are inherently fast. You saw that we can have a very fast motion during the snapping with concentric view robots. And also with the uh, pneumatic robot, also we could achieve very fast uh, motions. So there is no limitation there as long as you don't burst out or you don't uh, break your actuation mechanism. Uh, but what the target is, in medical applications, the target is usually very slow motions uh, because um, the, we, the, the problem is uh, reaching a, side, a position inside the body with minimum invasion, not doing it uh, very fast and uh, rapid. But in some other applications like pick and place, uh, like soft creepers, the actuation time uh, um, is uh, important. Our target for um, uh, response time um, is actually quasi-static motions, and for the robot accuracy, we need half a millimeter of uh, robot accuracy for our eye surgery application with concentric tube robots, but it's different from application to application. Thank you very much, Dr. Hadi. Yeah. Thank you so much for the questions. Okay, uh, we still have if I miss uh, any other question, okay, we have question in the chat uh, uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, so uh, I will translate it. Uh, have you used uh, fuzzy theory for the for your research? Uh, there's a question from Ernie Seniwati from Amikom Yogyakarta. Uh, I just uh, share with you my uh, web page and also. Uh, the uh, the package the GitHub repository for the package, um, so you can actually follow everything there. Um, so here you are. So I just uh, uh, pasted the links in the in the chat box. Okay, thank you. So there's another question from Bonaventura. Please, you can. Uh, ask that is gonna send to that edit, yeah? Yes, thank you, sir. So I just wanted to ask one simple question based on your uh, research. What's the best design to reduce the error from what you have done throughout all your research? Thank you. Uh, okay, to handle the error, you can actually um, use a, a good method to, uh, to model your robot, and you can uh, try to improve the fabrication process. Uh, but if uh, the robot is hard to model and the fabrication process is hard to control, uh, you can use learning. So build your robot, capture a lot of data, and then form a neural network and uh, train that neural network with that data. You, you're going to get a good uh, learned model. Um, you, there, there, there are a lot of publications on learning-based modeling and control of uh, continuum robots uh, that you can refer to. All right. Any other question? Uh, I'd like to uh, myself. I would like to uh, ask about one line in your slide, Dr. Verati. It is interesting that. Interesting that uh, you mentioned in the modeling, deep learning is exclude. Can you elaborate more on that? Why do you exclude yeah. uh, deep learning? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, my approach has been uh, the theoretical approach to, to model continuum robots. So I investigated the theoretical uh, 
side of it, not the learning-based side of it. And as I uh, mentioned in the presentation, when you do a theoretical modeling of continuum robots, you need to consider those um, aspects of the model. But if you're uh, using a deep learning or data-driven approach, uh, you don't care about the um, yeah, kinematics yeah. or governing equation, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going, I'm trying to do that direction as well, but I haven't investigated that part of the field yet myself. Okay, yeah, uh, there's another question in the chat, uh, Dr. Yebra. The idea, what is the software you use for animation of soft robots? Uh, it's time? MATLAB. Yeah, it's MATLAB. Just have a look at the repository that they share. It has the, uh, the M files that generates the animation as well. Including the finite element or something? No? Um, um, well, actually, yes, including that, I have my own way of uh, showing the finite element motions. You see, you're going to see some videos in the repository. Just search for the videos and you see them. Uh, but there are other softwares as well. Uh, I can introduce you to uh, Zofa to have a look and also Pi Elastic. Also, there is a Soro Scene. Uh, these three other softwares are and many more other softwares are developed for modeling continuum robots, but none dev drives the equation of motion for you to, if, if you want to investigate the, uh, the um, controller design for, uh, for such systems. All right. Uh, and probably the last question for this session is that uh, we have the um, last question here. Is it possible? Uh, it's possible to propose modeling in uh, robotic area and, um, for for the beginner. Uh, is it okay to publish? Oh, I see. In terms of so modeling, it, uh, I don't quite get the the question, um, but I can direct you to. Uh, two publications on uh, the different, uh, the comparison of the modeling methods in uh, continuum uh, robotics and soft robotics. Uh, one uh, you, you can find uh, in the uh, presentation as well, which is myself. So we, I, we did a comparison there. And also the other one is from uh, the University of Waterloo. Um, uh, let me find it from Jessica uh, Bergner Force yeah. on how to model tendon derivative roads. Um, we are putting some review papers together as well, but it won't be out until uh, next year. Um, so hopefully uh, it can be uh, good. So uh, it, it could be helpful as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much for the uh, presentation. I have to rush out for an online medical uh, session. Okay, doctor. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And the uh, session should stop now as we still have another session of talk. There's a room of improvement, I guess, in the soft robotics. I guess so. Uh, there are many important things to do more research or probably collaboration, I hope. Again, thank you, Dr. Sarati, for the valuable sharing of the soft robotics. And thank you for our audience and participants who have joined us uh, until now. And that's the end of this session. I will return the screen and time to the Kenafi. And thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sadati and Dr. Munawar Agus Riyadi for the remarkable sharing. That's very interesting topic and discussion, but unfortunately the time is very limited and you still, if you have still any question, you can uh, contact uh, Dr. Sadati in the links in the chat box. Yeah. And that marks the end of our, our first session. And before we start the second session, we would like to ask uh, all of the participants to take the picture again, <laughs> because we still don't have uh, any picture with our first speakers. Then <laughs> please open uh, the camera and we will take the picture group again.
Hopefully, Dr. Sadat is still here. <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. Then we will make a fast photograph. Uh, Dok, uh, Pak Hada, are you there? Yes. Okay. I'm already taken the pictures. Thank you. Okay. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, already done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pak Hada, for uh, having taking the picture. And then uh, we will have the second session of guest lecture. The speaker will be Dr. Ahmad Ataka Awal Rizki with the title Potential of Soft Growing Robots for Application in Extreme Environments. And the moderator is Dr. Yoga Dharma Setiawan. Dr. Yoga Dharma Setiawan earned all his advanced academic degree in United States. And he is active in, in the research and development of prosthetic and medical robots, nanosatellite for marine and coastal monitoring, and manufacturing vehicles and electric bus. He is the head of robotics and automation lab at Central Laboratory for Research and Services at uh, Diponegoro University. And I would like to invite Dr. Yoga Dharma Setiawan. And Dr. Yoga Dharma Setiawan, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Novi. So we have 45 minutes for the next uh, uh, presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore. Semoga uh, semua sehat-sehat. I will talk mostly in English. <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Ahmad Ataka. Can you hear us? Yeah, I see here. Yes. You already here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Welcome you. to this uh, guest lecture session by CEO Biomes. Uh, I would like to read your uh, CV first. Uh, let me share the screen. I would like to show. Uh, your CV. So Dr. Ahmad Ataka currently is the postdoctoral fellow uh, at uh, National Technological, uh, Nanyang Technological University, NTU, uh, under Continental NTU Corporate Lab, uh, Future Oriented Continental Urban Society or Focus Lab in Singapore. He earned his PhD in robotics degree from King's College London in 2019. Uh, he didn't go through the master degree, so he jumped directly from Bachelor of Engineering uh, directly to the PhD program. He graduated from Universitas Gajah Mada in 2014 from Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, and then his research interest is in robot autonomy, particularly in control, obstacle avoidance, and navigation of robots, uh, including for robots uh, with soft materials and continuum robots. We already uh, Reason or uh, follow the presentation, the soft material and continuum robots from Dr. Hadi. And then the topic right now is will be going more interesting, I think so, because will be not just for medical, medical application. Uh, he will discuss about the application in extreme, uh, extreme applications. So it will be very interesting. Let's see another uh, uh, here. We can see the research projects and experiences of Dr. Ahmad Ataka. He is right now uh, working under the supervisor of Professor Dino Akoto yeah, at NTU. And then he has worked for several research assistance positions previously. 
at Gajah Mada University, and then also with Professor Kaspar Altover at King's College, uh, London. So he has worked with Professor Kaspar Altover. I checked this professor, he's very excellent professor. And then his, his supervisor also, Dr. Hak Kung Lam, is very excellent professor. They are, uh, both of them has uh, Scopus Index more than, I think more than 50, around 40, 50 or more. Scopus Index, and then uh, very excellent uh, research teams that uh, Dr. Ataka has joined with. And then Dr. Ataka is very young. I think he is a, a millennial generation. He is very inspirative and then very highly uh, accomplished uh, person. He has won the medals for Olympiads, I think, right uh, before here. Let's see. He has won the Olympiads in physics in 2010 in Croatia. And then he won many medals in robotics. And then he excelled in several programming, computer programming and hardware for robotics uh, applications. OK, let's start directly with the presentation of a very, I think, very inspirative, young, and highly accomplished person for today's presentation. Please, Dr. Ataka, uh, time and screen are yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon respected uh, faculties and staff from the Ponegoro University, also researchers from uh, CBiome 3S, and also uh, uh, students, uh, university students and researchers from, from the Ponegoro University and all the participants of this uh, guest lecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to convey my, my gratitude. So uh, I was invited here to, to talk about uh, and share about some of my past research. Uh, especially I would like to thank also uh, my colleague and friend since, I don't know, maybe since 12 years ago or sometimes, <laughs> Mr. Hada uh, for, for inviting me personally to, 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 uh, to share my, my, my research here. And also to uh, Dr. Joga for introducing me uh, with a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, let me now uh, share my screen. Uh, right. I hope you can see my slides now. Could you please confirm, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Yoga or, or other participants? Are okay, able to see my we slides? can see the yeah. presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, uh, today's talk will be about the potential of soft growing robots for application in extreme environments. So uh, I actually uh, just finished my postdoc at NTU uh, in August, so uh, a few weeks ago and just recently joined uh, uh, my previous university, Universitas Gajah Mada uh, in Yogyakarta. So Congratulations. I just arrived in Yogyakarta. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just arrived in Yogyakarta on Saturday. So <laughs> uh, after eight days uh, isolation home. period in Jakarta. <laughs> Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, uh, me and my family are all well. So hopefully uh, now we can, yeah, uh, uh, hopefully this talk can be, can be the start of, of potential collaborations between us. Right, so uh, this is some, some details about myself. Uh, uh, Dr. Joga already introduced me. So uh, yeah, if, if you want to know more details about my research, you can take a look at my Bitbucket website. So because I just joined Universitas Gajah Mada, I currently do not yet have the the official web page, <laughs> but yeah, hopefully uh, soon uh, there will be uh, more updates on that. So yeah, so this is some some details about my research interests. So and how I can how I come here. Uh, 
So uh, as mentioned by Dr. Joga, I was studying uh, in, in Universitas Gajah Mada and during my undergrad, I did uh, my, my undergraduate uh, thesis on robot navigation, particularly for UAV. Uh, and then after that, uh, 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 in a conference, my supervisor back then, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Adha from, from Universitas Gajah Mada met Professor Altweaver. So uh, Professor Altweaver is a researcher at uh, King's College London at the time, already a full professor, uh, majoring on, on well, on, on a lot of things. He did his PhD on navigation, and then he moved to sensing, and then he moved to medical robotics, and then he moved to soft robots, so human-robot interaction. So I actually, uh, uh, that's why, uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I choose him and try to apply to him. And then uh, we did uh, uh, also uh, navigation and control, but not for UAV, but this time for, for soft robots, uh, which, is, which has been mentioned by, by Hadi uh, in the previous session. So me and Hadi also uh, were, were working in the same room. <laughs> Literally, we were sitting very close to, to, to each other uh, before. So Hadi started first, I think about a year before me. So, uh, and apart from soft robotics at King's College, we also work with human robot collaboration. So the idea is to, 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 to be able to make a robot safely and, and uh, intelligently work together with, with human. So because in the past, like robot always work separately, uh, uh, difference with, with human, but now we want to actually want to achieve uh, human robot collaborations. And uh, recently since joining, uh, since uh, leaving Queen Mary. So after my, after my PhD, I actually took a postdoctoral position at Queen Mary because Professor Kaspar moved to Queen Mary uh, during my PhD. Uh, fortunately, it's, it's in the same city, just uh, maybe half an hour uh, by train. So it was uh, not that far. Uh, and, uh, and I worked with him for, for, I think, a year and four months before going back to Indonesia and then uh, joining NTU. Uh, and I start to, to work more on robot learning, particularly on reinforcement learning, uh, but still, still uh, for, for robotics applications. Right, so uh, uh, these are some of the project experiences that I, 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 I had uh, been involved. Uh, so there is stiff flop. So this is the project that was mentioned by Dr. Hadi previously, uh, which is a, a European project on surgical robotics. And then there is also four by three. Four by three is more on human robot interaction side. So the idea is to, to make a, a rigid robot, but uh, so uh, to, to make it modular. So the idea is for the workers in the, uh, in the industry to be able to easily uh, built uh, the robot by themselves. So literally just, just like a Lego by connecting different components together depending on their needs. And then at Queen Mary, uh, as a postdoc, I work for two projects. One is called NCNR, which is National Center for Nuclear Robotics uh, and Wormbot. Uh, so these two are mainly the project that I would like to share uh, this afternoon. So NCNR is uh, uh, EPSRC project. So EPSRC is uh, Engineering and Physical Science Research Council uh, in the UK, uh, which funds uh, a lot of research activity uh, in engineering and natural sciences. So the idea here is to, to, to be able to make robots to be deployed in nuclear environments. So that's why we call it extreme environments. And then secondly, there is a warm water project. So this one is funded by Innovate UK. And the idea is to, to create a worm-like robots to be able to deliver uh, object or deliver uh, some, some components uh, underground in cluttered environments. I will talk more details about these two projects. And then uh, in the last couple of months uh, uh, at NTU, uh, I have been fortunate enough to work uh, with Prof. Dino Akoto in, in collaboration with Continental. Continental is... Uh, multinational company from Germany, uh, where we work together to create an intelligent and adaptive mobile cobot. So cobot stands for collaborative robots. So it's still related to this four by three project. But now the idea is we want to integrate this mobile collab uh, this collaborative robot with a mobile platform to be able to, to perform more complicated tasks 
and to be able to interact more with, with the human. So, uh, so this is some of the outlines of, of today's talk. Uh, I will start with soft robotics first because before we, we uh, uh, delve into growing robot, I think it's 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 important to to introduce you to soft robotics first. Uh, I know Dr. Hadi already explained uh, uh, quite a lot regarding soft robotics, so uh, uh, this might not be uh, new to you, but uh, still I think it's it's good to to introduce to soft robotics and then to move slowly to the growing uh, robots uh, applications. Right, so uh, soft robotics has been a while for quite some time now. Uh, so the, the initial motivations is because in the past people, when people talk about robots, it's always something like this, right? Which is not necessarily bad. It, it's actually quite good for applications in, in, in industrial environments. So, but it's, it's rigid, it's heavy. It's non-flexible, so if it hits something, well, yeah, it, it, it can it can hurt people basically, and also there is some limitation about its manipulation and grasping capability because in order to be able to grasp something with this robot, you need some sort of uh, gripper or grasping mechanism at the tip. So the whole body, the other the, other, the rest of the body, will only be useful to 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 locate or to, to, to move the tip towards the target location or orientation. But we cannot really use the, the other parts of the robot to, to perform something. Uh, only at the tip we can, we can, uh, we can do uh, manipulations. So these are some of the uh, uh, motivation. Even though this type of robot is very useful in industry when you know, the, the task is quite, uh, quite boring, <laughs> I would say. It's just uh, performing the same stuff over and over again where the accuracy and, and uh, probably the robustness is very important. It can continue working probably for, I don't know, for, for one day perhaps without stop and still maintain the same, the same performance, which is good in industrial application. However, we probably, uh, it's probably difficult to move this type of robots outside this, this uh, uh, design environment. Because, uh, because of this problem, it's difficult to move this type of robots, not even outside the, the let's say, the industrial side, even inside the factory, when there is a human, it's still very, very difficult to, to, to use this type of robots because of the safety concern. So that's why uh, starting from uh, uh, 60s or maybe 70s, uh, there starts to be uh, uh, work that uh, try to propose something different. So initially, it's not really soft. It's still rigid, but it's actually used quite a lot of uh, links and joints in such a way that the number uh, the number of joints makes it possible to 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 see this robot as as uh, some some form of a continuum structure or continuous structure. So as you can see here, it's it's quite different with this one. Here we can see this link one. This is link two. This is link three probably. While here, because the number of the link is quite a lot, it's it's actually quite difficult to 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 uh, basically use uh, the, the the same principle that we have here into this system. So initially, it's called redundant robots because it has so many joints, it has so many redundancy. Redundancy meaning it's it it has more degrees of freedom than it requires to 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 perform normal tasks. You know, for example, this type of robot. It has probably, I don't know, maybe 20 links together, uh, closely assembled together. And even this one as well, they, it, it actually resembles some snake, right? So this is a very famous uh, robot from Hirose. So this is the early generation of uh, uh, something called hyper-redundant robot. It's still a rigid robot. It's not soft yet. And it's actually also not, theoretically, it's uh, not continuous yet because it still consists of uh, multiple elements, multiple rigid elements uh, coupled together. Uh, but starting from from here, now we have so many uh, so many examples of robot that is not only continuum but also soft. So uh, mainly all of these robots took inspirations from from nature, from biology. Uh, you know, if you have uh, probably uh, seen uh, octopus, uh, you know the octopus tentacle. Uh, maybe if you watch SpongeBob, there is uh, Squidward, right? There is a character that is uh, probably it's an octopus. 
and also the 11th trunk. So the trunk of an 11 is also uh, soft and continuous. So there, there start to appear uh, this, this kind of work in the 90s, 2000s, and now in 2018, there are so many soft robotics design and applications in the world. You can actually take a look at some of the recent uh, review papers. It's, there are so many, literally there are like so many designs that uh, yeah, we, we, we couldn't really uh, count how many different robotic designs that are now available. So uh, what's, what makes this soft robot actually uh, soft robot? So here uh, there is actually uh, uh, the difference between, so there are actually three terms that I want to, to emphasize. First of all, there is comparison between, uh, between uh, discrete robots to continuous robot. So this kind of things, the KUKA robot that we had in the beginning, it's, it's, it's a discrete robot because we can actually count the number of links and joints that it has. However, the more the joints that a robot has, as you can see here, it becomes like more like a snake. And even here, it has so many joints, it is already unlike this type of robot anymore. It, it becomes something that is continuous or continuum structure, where the, the modeling will be very, very different than this one. Uh, so this is continu continuum robots. There is also another types of continuum robots, uh, which is called soft robots. So it's not only continuous, so it, not, it doesn't, so it's not only uh, uh, having a continuous structure, uh, but it also soft, soft meaning, uh, you know, in Japanese, we call something uh, as, you know, like, like, um, uh, like, like, for example, in Japanese, it's called empu, you know, I always call this robot empu in, in, in Indonesia. So it's soft robotics, it's something that is soft, flexible, you can actually touch it and it will deform. If you hit this robot, okay, you will, you will probably uh, hurt your, your, your arm, but if you hit this robot, probably the robot will be broken <laughs> because it's, it's actually quite soft and, and flexible and probably a bit, a bit fragile for, 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 for some designs. But yeah, because of this, this different design, it's actually more suitable in environments where the robot is expected to interact with human. Because if you imagine this kind of robot, uh, you know, entering into your body, you see, uh, for, for a surgery. Well, I, I will probably feel not really comfortable, right? Because if something wrong happened, this, this thing, this uh, rigid thing can probably, I don't know, hurt my, my body part. Uh, while if we have this type of robot, it's actually safer to, to so the, the, the contact there, the contact force is less. So it's actually a safer interaction with the environment. So there are uh, so many working, different working principle. Uh, you know, so if, if we take a look at the rigid robots, so the, well, it's, it's kind of boring because you know, the, the, the models is there. You, you can write down the kinematics, the dynamics. Now we have in ROS, now we have URDF, right? Universal Robot Description. We just, we just type in the, the size and the, the mechanical property of the links in the, in the URDF, or probably you can also import that from, uh, I don't know, from a 3D models and, and it will calculate everything for you, which is good and, and, and very useful for, for, for some application. Uh, however, in, in soft robotics and continuum robotics, there are so many different ways to, to make a, a soft robotics or continuum robotics work. For example, like this, this, kind of, this kind of robot, it has tendon. So instead of electric motor, it used tendons, you know, like, like a thread. So, and using this tendon, when you pull one tendon, it will actually uh, move or bend to, to one direction. And if you pull another tendon, it will uh, move to another direction. It's actually very similar to, I mean, uh, uh, not very, but similar to maybe in, in Java, we have Wayan, right? And, and Dalang controlling the movement of this Wayan. Well, in, 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 in here, we also have a, a similar principle. We have the robot, the, the continuum robot, uh, actuated by tendon. So the tendon will, will affect the, the shape of the robot. Uh, apart from tendon, there is also a, a pneumatic that can be used. Uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Hadi mentioned in the previous talk about the stiff flop manipulator, it uses uh, pressure uh, to actuate or to, to create deformation in the soft structure uh, to finally create this bending shape. There is also another way like hydraulics 
and uh, also concentric cube robot, which was explained uh, uh, in, in a very detail uh, by, by Dr. Hadi previously. And there is also some other ways like using shape memory loins. Basically, this is some, some kind of uh, materials where uh, it will actually uh, uh, bend or it will actually contract when you apply some, some voltage. There is also a recently uh, a usage of smart materials. So that's why when, when I heard about this center, uh, C-Biome 3S, uh, I really like that, that, uh, that in, in, in the Ponegoro University, you combine uh, everything, including materials, because I believe using smart materials is one of the future trend in robotics. And we have to, we have to kind of, uh, uh, use this, this, this smart materials to create new types of robot that we, we probably never seen before. Uh, so this is a very, uh, there are so many different design and each design has their own uh, models. So that's, that's what makes this quite complicated because the model for tendon based robot will be different uh, compared to the models for, for, uh, for the pneumatic based robot because the way that the, the mechanical structure behaves in responding to, to force from the tendon and in responding to you know, pressure from the pneumatic is, is quite different. So there are uh, pros and cons uh, 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 if we talk about soft robotics. So for example, uh, soft robotics, I mean, uh, we, talk a lot, uh, we talk a lot about the advantages. So let's start here. So it's inherently soft and then safe. It's lightweight. It's, it's probably uh, only a few kilograms. It's also flexible shape. So if, we, if it has flexible shape, you know, if, if uh, the robot is deployed in a difficult environment, like underground environment, we don't actually need a complex navigation strategy because by nature, by the nature of the structure, it will actually deform when it touches uh, objects or, or rigid objects. So it's, it has a flexible shape. And also it, it's, it's able to perform complex uh, maneuver. So it can, it can form bending, can extra, uh, extending, contracting, twisting, so many possible uh, 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 configurations. And then these things, this, this type of robot can perform something called whole body grasping. So if you imagine uh, we have soft robot like this, the whole body of the robot can be used to actually grasp something like, like a ball or something, right? And then there is also another, another interesting property. We can actually use soft robotics as a sensor to detect contact or to detect force in the environment. Because when we know uh, that if there is uh, some force uh, applied to this kind of materials, it will deform. And if we can detect the deformation, we can actually estimate the, the, the amount of force that is exerted to this uh, uh, robots, but also there are so many challenges. So <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Yoga already mentioned some of the challenges in the previous talk with Dr. Hadi, which is it's so difficult to create this uh, structure that can perform uh, uh, perform uh, uh, the same task over and over again with high accuracy. So it has very low accuracy in comparison to rigid wing robots. Uh, also, the load capability is normally uh, less. So if we have rigid robot, we can probably has I don't know, 10 kilograms payload, maybe 20 kilograms payload. But with this type of robot, it's, it's very little. So it's only a few kilograms, probably. Also, the shape estimation is complicated, you know, because if we have this type of robot, the, uh, like the structure can, can, can behave like very weird. Right? It's, it's not like a rigid robot where it, it stays rigid. It's the, the shape can be quite complicated. And uh, for, for a control engineer like myself, we uh, like the knowledge about this shape is actually essential if we want to control the robot. So also sensing. So if we want to detect the shape, we have to kind of uh, embed a, a sensor in, in the robot body, which is challenging as well. And of course, on top of that modeling, which Dr. Hadi already explained and also control, uh, which is very challenging. Uh, uh, that's why this kind of research, uh, I think I saw some questions in, in participant in, in the previous session. This type of uh, research is still very open for publication. So uh, even though uh, uh, already there are some well-established uh, uh, models, like Dr. Hadi explained, and some of the well-established control mechanism, I would say this kind of research is still very interesting because there are so many different soft robots and in so many different applications where we can, we can propose uh, different model, modeling or control uh, algorithms. 
Okay, uh, now let's see some cool application first before we move on to the growing robots. Uh, so this is the stiff flop manipulators, uh, which was developed at King's College London uh, in, in a European company uh, led by my previous supervisor, Professor Kaspar Altweaver. So this type of robot is actually uh, uh, designed for surgical application. So it, it was made of sil uh, silicon. So the silicon materials here, is very deformable, and then it, it was actuated by by uh, pneumatics using three uh, different air chamber. And as you can see here, it can actually perform some nice movements, even though uh, uh, at that time uh, the time response still not not very good. But the performance is uh, was quite nice. So it was actually uh, uh, at the time was implemented to to try to help surgeon. Uh, to perform surgery, uh, even though at the time it was not really implemented for real surgical application, but uh, we managed to apply it for uh, like uh, uh, like miniature miniaturized body like this one uh, or or body uh, cadaver. Uh, so this is some of some of the uh, uh, works that. So the the work that I'm doing is actually trying to to perform navigation of this type of robot. So if we know uh, if we have this type of robot and we want to apply it to perform something, uh, uh, it's still uh, uh, good to have a navigation mechanism. So uh, uh, that's why in in some of the uh, my past research at Kings, I I try to develop a control and navigation strategy for this type of robots. So if we assume that we only has uh, limited knowledge of the environment, so it doesn't have like the perfect perfect map of the environment. So how can we we make this type of uh, 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 soft robotics uh, perform navigations? So uh, these are some of the simulation uh, scenario that I have uh, developed uh, during mostly during my PhD and, and my first postdoc. And there's also some, some simple implementation where we're able to, to, to actually uh, implement this mechanism to, to help these soft, soft robots to avoid obstacles. And then there's also some, uh, oh, why it's playing again? Ah, this one. This is some cool work from, from my colleague at Queen Mary at the time, uh, Jan Fras. Uh, so Jan is actually an expert in creating soft structure. <laughs> so if, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I'm myself, uh, I'm more, more of a control engineer, so uh, I mostly uh, use uh, whatever soft materials that my colleague developed <laughs> back then, including Jan. So Jan is actually the, the main, uh, let's say the main guy behind Stiflop, and he used the experience with Stiflop to create many, many different uh, soft structures. So uh, I think he also has some good publications on on the details of the fabrication. So if uh, Dr. Yuga or others are interested, I can uh, probably point you to, to his uh, works afterwards. So this one is, is a soft hand, soft prosthetic hand. Uh, as you can see there, it's, it's very uh, human-like movement. It's all using, using silicon and using pneumatics. And also, let's see the next video. Uh, he also developed a, a soft octopus robot uh, which was very famous <laughs> in our lab at Queen Mary. Uh, so in every demonstration that we have, we always bring this robot. <laughs> so this, this uh, octopus robot can be used to actually uh, 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 to mimic the movement of the animals uh, like octopus and can be useful for, for actually helping uh, biologists to study uh, animals. And then recently he also has this uh, robotic fish uh, which can actually uh, uh, swim really nicely. <laughs> so, so yeah, so if you're interested, uh, uh, you can take a look at Jan Fras' work. Uh, uh, I can also point you later on to, to his uh, publications. And then there is also this work from my colleague, Agostino Stili, uh, uh, which was also a PhD student of Kaspar at the time. And now he's, he's becoming a lecturer at UCL. So Agustino is, is uh, focusing on variable stiffness link. So the idea here is, let's say we have a robot, like, like standard uh, rigid robot like this one, but now we can actually control the softness or the stiffness of the link. So the link, as you can see here, is not made of, uh, of uh, like hard materials, but it's actually made of fabric. 
and Agostino uh, uh, has some uh, some sort of balloon inside, uh, so we can actually uh, uh, pump the air uh, inside this fabric to control the amount of pressure inside this fabric and then control the stiffness. So now it's actually very stiff. It works exactly like a digitaling robot. However, if we have, for example, uh, I don't know, human around, we can actually tune the pressure in such a way that it becomes really, really soft. So like this one now, uh, uh, so it can be, <laughs> you know, uh, it can be deformed like this one because it's, it's really soft. You can actually control the pressure to, to, to actually uh, play around with the stiffness. So uh, this is a very nice work by Agostino. Uh, this is uh, some of the works in uh, Queen Mary uh, when I was a postdoc uh, helping one of the PhD students uh, called Dawood. So Dawood actually used uh, uh, soft materials to create a soft artificial skin. So his, his PhD is about creating an artificial skin for a robot. So he has these materials uh, which consists of a lot of uh, capacitive elements. Uh, so when you uh, stretch the material, the capacitance uh, will, will, will be changed. And when you detect this change, you can actually estimate how much the stretch that is being applied to this material. And not only stretch, there is also mechanism to detect uh, indentation or force. And you can actually locate uh, where this force is located. So if we have this kind of things embedded in our soft robots, so we have, I mean, we have a robot that can sense like, like us, we, like, that, that has artificial skin. Uh, uh, still very early works, now still uh, under development as well. So if you're interested in that, take a look at Dawood's uh, research. Uh, this is a research that I co-author with uh, uh, my colleague Harish Gudaba, which was a postdoc at Queen Mary at the time and now become a lecturer at Surrey University. So before going, going to the UK, Harris was uh, doing a postdoc at Singapore. Uh, so we kind of switch our place after that. So I went to Singapore and he, he stayed in the UK. So, right, so this one is, is actually creating a bending sensor. So what uh, I explained previously, one of the challenge in soft robotics is to try to estimate the shape. So if we have soft structure like this one, we can actually create a bending sensor that can detect the bending of this this uh, structure. With Harish work, he actually use uh, uh, optical sensor. So, so he has uh, a light source at the base. So the light source will actually emit uh, light, uh, like uh, electromagnetic waves, right? And then it will be reflected. So it, it has some sort of cable uh, or guide that will guide the light towards the, the, the light sensor at the base. So imagine if, if it's still straight, if it's still straight, the light goes up and then reflect it and then goes down. And then it will be very high intensity because there is not much uh, uh, difference in the light intensity uh, uh, previously. But if, it's, uh, uh, if, if, if it has more bending, the more that it bends, uh, because of the shape of the, of the structure, the light intensity that got reflected back is actually less. So that's why if we calibrate this, this light intensity uh, value, we can actually estimate the amount of bending that this uh, robot is, is having. So as you can see here, so it's uh, also quite nice. So not only in the lab, there is also some, some industrial company that start to, to work with continuum and sub robots. This one is actually uh, from a very uh, 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 famous company uh, called OC Robotics. It's actually moving in, a, in a, a reactor as well inside the pipe. So it's actually quite extreme environment here. Uh, so it, it actually can be used to detect, detect the, the problem or, or the leakage in the pipe. So it's, it's like a snake-like uh, snake robot. Uh, let's see uh, whether we have... Yeah, so it can also perform some, some uh, laser cutting uh, to perform some, some works over there. Uh, yeah, OC Robotics, you can refer to the video. Uh, how many time, how much time? Okay, we still have a few minutes. Uh, try to be quickly, to be quicker. Now this is uh, Festo Soft Gripper. Uh, so Festo is a German company, I believe, that is uh, now starting to move towards also soft robotics. So they have a very nice soft gripper uh, that can be, can be used to, to grasp so many different objects. So this is also uh, another of Festo robot called uh, Bionic Handling Assistant. 
uh, which was also very very nice product. So uh, so yeah, this kind of thing not only in the lab but it also already uh, uh, implemented or designed by by uh, industry company. Right, so uh, there's still some robot. <laughs> now we start to actually move towards the growing thing. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, you're still there. <laughs> so this is, uh, uh, so the idea here, if we have a soft robotics, one of the main challenges is actually in soft robot, if it's, if it's still soft, it's difficult to perform anything because if it's too soft, if you want to lift some heavy object, it cannot perform the work, right? Because it's, it's, it's just soft, it, it cannot be controlled, the, the stiffness cannot be controlled. However, if we, if, we want, if we can create some mechanism that can make the softness of the robot can be controlled, it will actually uh, improve the performance of this kind of robot. So that's why there is uh, an area called inflatable robots, which try to control the stiffness of the robots. Not only that, if we can actually grow the robot, uh, like you know, like a plant, uh, when uh, the, the root of the plant is actually growing toward the soil, right? So if we can actually grow this kind of robot, it will be really, really useful for many applications. So that's why uh, there is uh, uh, works in recent years that start to explore this environment. One of the early works uh, that I could find is a work from uh, Professor Okamura's group. Actually, Professor Kaspar was. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, he, he really likes and, and uh, appreciate uh, Professor Okamura works, but actually he, he thought that initially he had the idea before her, <laughs> but he didn't quite manage to, to create something at the time. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, the uh, Professor Okamura published this work, which was really nice work uh, published in Science Robotics. <laughs> so that's why after this publication, Professor Kaspar uh, uh, very quickly uh, assembled his team to create uh, uh, and and actually explore a growing robot. So the idea here is this uh, this robot was made of plastic. So it it's like uh, uh, the sleeve of your of your shirt, right? So if you have your shirt like this, and then you can actually blow from the inside, it will actually start expanding, right? So the the inside of the materials will actually come outside like this one, right? So uh, that's the principle behind this plastic robot, uh, and then. Uh, uh, there is also another uh, 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 work in the same directions, uh, also by, by my colleague Agostino Stili, uh, that, that actually try to create this, this in, inflatable or expanding robot. So, so the robots start from, uh, from, from these uh, uh, configurations, and then you can actually make it grow and make it, uh, uh, what is it, bending, creates bending. So let's see. So it, it, it creates bending. Now it's inflated. Uh, uh, let me let me show you the part where it where it actually grows. So it's deflating to a very short length, almost <laughs> yeah, almost like just just like a bundle. Uh, but now uh, because of this uh, uh, capability of this material, it can actually grow and uh, and 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 yeah, and become longer. And also it can perform quite a lot of uh, different. Uh, structures or different configurations. So this type of robot, it use actually two actuation. One, uh, so inside there is there is a latex blader, you know, like like a, like a balloon, and then there is also a tendon. Uh, so out, outside the balloon we have a fabric, and then there is a tendon in the outside. So the balloon you can actually put uh, the the air in to, to increase the pressure and to make the robot grow. However, once the robot grows to, to perform the, the maneuver or to, to perform the bending, we use tendons like, like this one, uh, tendons to, to create the bending. So uh, you can actually take a look in more details in the modeling and control of these works in our co uh, paper uh, in IWAS. And then uh, uh, after this, Professor Kaspar starts to, to move towards something called uh, inversion robot. The principle is very similar to the growing robot by uh, Professor Okamura's team, but Professor Kaspar actually used uh, fabric. So uh, with, with fabric, the, the material is actually quite strong and it's, it's, it's also quite easy to, to, be, to be sewn together, you know, uh, using sewing machine. So uh, at Queen Mary, actually, we, <laughs> we, we, we had a sewing machine and me and, and the other students actually 
try to learn how to sew. <laughs> okay, uh, hopefully I still have time. Okay, two minutes left. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be, to be quicker. Uh, so that's the idea of efficient robot. Uh, now, with the same principle, we can actually create uh, artificial muscle. So if you if you connect the, the the fabric with tendon, you can actually create something like like a joint like this one. Uh, and then uh, now uh, this is where the extreme environment start to 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 kick in. So the idea here is uh, there is a nuclear center in the UK uh, that already has uh, quite uh, a lot of radiation materials that needs to be clear. So for the human to do that is quite complicated because then the human, the, the environment is quite dangerous. Uh, the environment is quite dangerous and we don't want the human to be, to be exposed to this, to this uh, radiations uh, waste. So that's why uh, uh, there is this NCNR project that try to bring the robot inside the nuclear industry. Uh, maybe I can uh, go again. So uh, the idea, the, the proposal that we had is, we want to use eversion robot to perform these tasks, to, to send something to the radiation area. Why? Because if we use this kind of robot, we can actually start uh, at the base, uh, at the very, at, at a location very far from the radiation, radiation source. We can start uh, uh, quite far and then we can grow the robot and the robot can enter the environment where we have radiations. That's one, one uh, solution. Another reason why we use eversion robot is because in the robot itself, we almost do not have any electronics. So you see everything is, is using fabric. Even the, the, the bending mechanism, we use actually also fabric. So in the outside of the robot, we actually create like pouches, you know, like, like pockets of, of uh, uh, like po empty pockets. And then we pump an air in to create the bending mechanism. So everything is using pneumatics. The electronic is only at the base to control the pressure. So the robot itself uh, doesn't, doesn't use uh, much electronic on the robot body, which is very, very important in radiation environment because radiation uh, uh, doesn't like electronics. So <laughs> it can uh, kill the electronics uh, uh, after a few hours. So uh, this is where we, uh, when we, uh, uh, why we develop this kind of robot. So it can, it can perform bending, it can perform growing. So everything that you can see here was actually manufactured uh, by ourselves in the lab using the sewing machine. That's why I believe this type of robot is very, uh, very potential in Indonesia because we have, I mean, uh, we can create the robot ourselves using sewing machine and it's very cheap. And then uh, maybe I can skip this part, skip this part. I'll go directly to this video. Just two more videos, I promise. <laughs> so this is the, the control. So uh, because I'm a control guy, uh, I want to uh, perform uh, the control using this, this efficient robot uh, to perform some trajectory tracking. Uh, the good thing about this robot is we can actually change the internal pressure. So we can change the stiffness of the robot. If, if we want the robot to be soft, we can, we can make it soft. Uh, for example, uh, here, if it's soft, it cannot really push this object. It, it, it only moves uh, uh, slightly. But if we want to move these objects quite far, we can actually increase the pressure. So this 0.7 bar which is quite high. It's already moving quite a lot. But if we have 0.3 bar, it almost doesn't move, right? So, so depending on the application, if we want safety, we can, uh, lower the pressure. If you want accuracy, we can increase the pressure, uh, which is good. Uh, just one last thing. <laughs> one last thing is the observer-based control. So the idea is very similar, but now we assume that we have a camera at the tip, sorry, at the top, that can actually track the robot's body and perform the control in an online manner. Uh, similarly, we can also make the stiffness to be really low or to be really high, depending on the application. So, uh, Yes, and uh, these other applications in the Wombok project, we use this robot to perform delivery in underground exploration. Maybe I can show you, uh, this is the robot that is growing inside the lab, but I can show you where it's applied in, in the underground environments. Uh, so this is also in the, in the lab, but it's, it's able to actually move in a very long distance and actually able to, to, to move uh, upward. 
uh, uh, using some control to, to actually uh, uh, move upstairs uh, like this one. Yeah, so this, I think this is 10 meters long, <laughs> this one. Yeah, and I mean, there are so many other applications. Uh, I think I can just skip this one. And yeah, like surgery, post-disaster application, underwater exploration, so many potential. So that's why uh, this is one of the research area that I would like to explore uh, uh, now that I am here uh, in Indonesia. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time uh, and for your attention. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad Ataka for very excellent uh, presentation on general overview of continuum and soft robotics. And then also for sharing fantastic uh, kind of robots. Uh, and then for sharing the, your experience from very prestigious research lab for different kind of soft and continuum robots for the many kinds of settings for this kind of robots. And then we are very happy you are back to Indonesia. So we have very highly, we, we have uh, very good potentials to collaborate uh, uh, with our research centers. Uh, okay, we now we are in the, uh, okay, hopefully we, uh, we can visit you or you can visit us. Yes, in yes, Semarang uh, very <laughs> soon yeah. <laughs> uh, after this uh, pandemic. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Uh, now we are in the Q&A session and discussion uh, to all participants, please. Uh, okay, some questions already appear in the chat room. I will, I will read in English. Uh, you can write in Indonesian. I can translate. I will try to, um, to translate to English or actually Dr. Ahmad can read it directly also. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> for the first question from uh, Ernie Senimat, Seniwati, Ibu Ernie Seniwati. So how far you uh, involve the involvement of codings or programming in your robotics? Okay, that's the first question. Maybe uh, we will just directly answer that question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the, I mean, it depends on, on, on the roles. I mean, uh, in my role as a more like a control engineer, it's, uh, I mean, programming robotics is, programming robot is like my day-to-day -day <laughs> work. So it's, uh, I use a lot of programmings, uh, uh, mostly uh, Python or C++ and uh, mostly using uh, uh, like middleware like, like ROS uh, or like simulators. Uh, I think there are so many good simulators right now. Uh, there is PyBullet that is free, uh, mainly for robot learnings. There is also SOFA for soft materials. I think Dr. Hadi already mentioned that. And there are others which also involves a lot of programming. So it's uh, in, in my role, it's, it's, it's quite a lot, yeah, a lot, lot of programming. Okay. I think uh, that's uh, answering the question. Okay, next to the next uh, question is from uh, Mr. Sudiro. Talking about online estimation, we often uh, get estimation result through constrained robot. I've done uh, something that by clipping the value, such that the constraint uh, uh, to be uh, according to what we want. Mm -hmm. But the instability uh, occurs. What is the solution? Okay, so here is a, uh, probably Dr. Ahmad Ataka knows uh, better on this. Thank you very much. This is actually a good question that I also experienced a few years back. Uh, I don't have a ready to uh, ready to use answers right now, but there is actually a field for for this one. It's actually uh, called uh, constraint uh, or or uh, uh, set estimations under under constraint under uh, hard constraint. So uh, this is uh, I mean quite frankly quite challenging. And uh, you know uh, the thing that I did in the past to solve this is actually the same thing that uh, uh, Mr. Sudiro. Uh, was doing so, <laughs> so we were we were in the same directions there. But there is uh, there is a 
uh, uh, like a line uh, research that is uh, working as to what this. Uh, uh, so maybe maybe later on I can I can find the the the, uh, the papers that I that I uh, could find in the past because uh, since then I haven't been working on on set estimations. Uh, uh, because of other other works that I'm doing, but yes, uh, I'm I'm happy if if uh, uh, Mr. Sundiro can actually contact me directly and to talk more about that, I will be more than happy. Yeah. Okay, so we let's uh, see the the other question. We have two more questions, I think, here uh, because the last one is actually the same as previous question. Okay, this is from Mr. Alvin. UEE, okay, thank you for your presentation. The main question is, what is the feasibility to manufacture or to fabricate this soft robot with our local resources in Indonesia? Okay, okay. Dr. Ahmad. Yes, uh, first of all, yes, I mean, uh, I believe we have the capability to do that because the, uh, the soft robots, most of the soft robot that I show uh, was manufactured using silicon. So yeah, we have, uh, and we use silicon for many things, right? For cosmetics, for for other mm -hmm. other other applications. Uh, but especially the growing robots that I just show. Uh, I mean, I mean we have because we have clothes, right? We have fabrics, we have mm -hmm. sewing machine. But we can we can create and manufacture this kind of robot. Any ourselves. special tools? Probably you probably have in at Gajah Mada Universities can uh, help or the, can yeah, support. At, at, at the moment, uh, not yet uh, uh, for for create. I mean, uh, not in, in my department, mm -hmm. but I know uh, in, in in mechanical engineering departments there is uh, works done by uh, uh, what's his name? I forget the name. <laughs> uh, 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 there is a lecturer in 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 the University of Gajamada in from mechanical engineer that works with, uh, with soft robotics. Okay, I couldn't recall the name now. Okay. Somehow. <laughs> I will, I will. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rifki knows. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, from, for, for, for fabric-based robotics, I believe we can, we can, we can just create ourselves using, using fabric and sewing machine. Mm. Uh, and we don't need to actually create ourselves. So we can actually create the design and then just mm -hmm. bring it to the to the to the professional sewer and they could probably do it for us because it's very similar to 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 our clothes right but the more challenging thing is to actually make sure that we don't have air leakage you know because if we if we just sew it yeah. there is so many holes in there yes. so we have to okay. apply other other materials on top of that and 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 dry it for quite a while normally we did it uh, we we dry it and wait for like a day, yeah, <laughs> for hours yes. to to yeah because uh, it's very essential because otherwise the air will just leak and the robot will not right uh, right leaking is a big problem. Yes yes. <laughs> okay okay, I think we have long question from Mr. Sudiro, but unfortunately we are uh, at the end of our session here, so I think uh, maybe the Mr. Sudiro can contact directly to Dr. Ahmad Ataka. Uh, we can share your PowerPoint later to the participants, right, Dr. Ahmad Ataka? Yes, inshallah. Yeah, you will get his uh, contact number uh, to all participants who are interested to contact, to discuss uh, um, more, elaborate more about uh, this kind of robot or for collaboration. Uh, uh, very lucky he is in Indonesia now, so we have big potentials to collaborate with Dr. Ahmad Ataka, who has very excellent experience and fantastic uh, achievement in this area. So I think we will just close this uh, pre presentation session. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad uh, Ataka. Uh, I hope your success with the new position at Gajah Mada University. And then I would like Thank you to much. give, let's ask, give warm applause to Dr. Ahmad Ataka for a very good presentation. And yes, then I, I would Thank like <laughs> to return the time and screen to the moderator, Dr. Novi. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad Ataka and Dr. Uh, Yoga Dharma Setiawan for the sharing. 
And to sum up, there are varied methods and approach that used to develop soft robot, especially for medical applications. Besides, uh, the soft robot can be also applied in extreme environments such as worm-like robots, soft hand fish, octopus robot, as well as uh, silicon-based capacity uh, A skin, E skin. Yeah. Okay, that's a very interesting topic and discussions. Okay, and that's mark the end of uh, our guest lecture today. As this is the our, uh, our last session, we would like also thank you all for our speaker and also our for your participants thank you and we would like to see you again to the next series of guest lecture by sebiomes diponegoro university thank you good afternoon have a uh, have a nice day thank you and bye bye thank you very much thank, thank you, you very much. Much. Terima kasih banyak. Insyaallah nanti kita berkolaborasi. Pakai oh, <laughs> foto ini dukungannya. Oh, pengen foto lagi. Oke. Okay. Ya, ya. Pak Ahmad ya. kan belum. Oh, Oke. Okay. So, uh, we would like to ask all of the participants to open your camera please again. <laughs> And Oke. <laughs> we would like to take a picture together at the end of our sessions. Oke. Okay. Pak Hada, could you please help us with uh, Aba-Aba? Yes. yes, sure, Bunda Fi. Uh, okay, <laughs> please open your camera. And uh, I will take a picture in... Wait a moment. Okay. One, two, three... Okay, let me let me save the, <laughs> the picture first, and I will take another one after this. Okay, so please save your smile. <laughs> okay. Okay then, one, two, three, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bruno. Okay, thank you very much and see you soon in the next uh, guest lecture of CBMS. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ataka. Saya mohon pamit dulu. Oke, Saya jawabnya metu gitu kan. Thank you. Terima kasih, eh, Bu Novi, atas uh, perkenannya eh. menjadi MC Pak Yoga. Terima kasih sebagai moderator Pak Munawar, Pak Rifki. Terima, eh, terima kasih, Pak Ada. Terima kasih, Bu Novi, Pak Ada, Pak Rifki. Jadi, sama-sama oh, Pak Yoga, jadi yeah. motor sun, standar. Motor sun, Pak Heru, Pak Wipu. Jadi, sama-sama. Oke, sehat-sehat, Pak Heru. Alhamdulillah. Wingi baru mau pelatihan dua minggu baru Mas Adi ya Mas Adianto yang Ardianto ya masih ya, ya. masih ya yang ketiga ahli ketiga oh. umum oke okay, oke okay. sudah saya pamit pamit dulu semoga pak Ibu sangat assalamualaikum katenon katenon pak katenon sangat ini Mas Hada, terima kasih banyak. Ini sudah yeah. menjadi organizing komite yang luar biasa. Matunun. Ya, yeah. sami-sami yeah, Pak Rifki. Semoga memberi manfaat. Yeah. Amin, amin. Yeah, Saya yeah. juga belajar tadi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Terutama yang matematikal modelingnya tadi. Dake, <laughs> <laughs> dake. Luar, yeah. luar biasa. Bareng-bareng. <laughs> yeah. 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 Assalamualaikum. Yeah, Waalaikumsalam. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.